And hello, everybody. You're very welcome to a new On Location episode. I am Sean Martin. I'm flying solo today. Marco is traveling uh, on his way to InfoSecurity Europe in London. I'll be following suit uh, very soon, and I'll be joining him there. And uh, a lot of our friends in, uh, I'll say, cybersecurity family there in London as we talk about uh, all the latest and greatest in terms of uh, business opportunities, uh, how to protect business revenue and, and uh, yeah, come together as a community to, uh, to make things better. So um, I'm excited to have uh, Stuart on with us. Stuart, uh, Stuart Seymour, he's the Director of Security of Virgin O2. Stuart, Stuart thanks for joining. Uh, Sean, thank you very much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's good, good to have you on. And uh, congrats on, on getting a, a spot at InfoSecurity Europe. It's uh, Thursday, June 6th at uh, five past two local time there. And the topic of your session is crisis management, responding to the unimaginable with a few, a few other panelists there. Um, are you excited for it? Yeah, no, absolutely I am. Absolutely I am. I mean, InfoSec um, is one of the go-to conferences um, in, in Europe um and uh the panelists that i have a privilege to to share a stage with are um incredibly knowledgeable so so yeah really looking forward to it and um really looking forward to hopefully giving um a you know really wor worthwhile session and so that other people can can learn from the multiple shovels in the face that i've had throughout my career um because yeah, no that's not that's not from breaking ground is it <laughs> no 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 i wish it was i yes. wish it was no this is just from uh different crises and uh how they manifest themselves yeah perfect uh so i'm excited to get into the topic with you um maybe a few words about who you are Stuart, what you're up to and uh yeah maybe maybe a look back into some of the other things you've done leading up to your your current role as well yeah, so um, I'm very uh, blessed to be the group uh, chief information security officer um, for um, Virgin Media O2. So that's the combination um, of two amazing brands, Virgin Media um, and O2, so broadband and and on the mobile side. Um, and you know, critical in connecting people. Um, and again, part of the real amazing work that we saw, you know, the company do was, you know, during COVID when people really needed that connection. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be, I'm very privileged to be uh, the CISO of, of, of that company. I'm very, very blessed to have the team that I do. Uh, prior to that, I was at uh, BAT, British American Tobacco. Before that, I was at Centrica, who are the owners of British Gas, Direct Energy in the States, um, which is a integrated energy company. And prior to that, Lockheed Martin. So that's how I came to be, um, you know, where I am. And uh, I was looking at your profile there, the Risk Advisory Group, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a risk nerd. And I'm sure everything you started with there uh, runs through everything you're doing now, if I had to guess. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of SecOps, a lot of incident response, um, and uh, yeah, lot, lots of fun stuff. I'm sure a few, a few shovels flying around there. Um, so the, this topic of crisis management, um, the, uh, the title of the session is Responding to the Unimaginable. And I, I think I understand why those two go together. The, the question I have to start off with is, is, is it really unimaginable or can we imagine it when we choose not to? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. That, that's, a, that's a really cool. That's a really good question. Um, a lot of it is unimaginable. And I study philosophy and I have a favorite philosopher and his name is Mike Tyson. 
And he said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And part of crisis management is absolutely about preparing, about imagining, about scenarios, about wargaming. But then there are things that just come out of such a left field that, that some of it is unimaginable. So if you think about, even though it's not a specific cyber event, but if you think about something like COVID-19, you know, before we had, um, you know, swine flu, then we had Ebola, and it was all contained in separate areas. People took it seriously as, as they should have, the, those two aspects, but nobody imagined COVID and nobody imagined a pandemic that would, you know, lock the world down to, to the extent that it did. We, we, we'd had different uh, epidemics, if you will, but, and, and we had all these uh, pandemic plans. And I remember doing the pandemic plans when I was at Centrica and I was responsible for resilience. And people were looking at things like swine flu and and Ebola and things like this and, and, and you know, looking at the containment, but nobody imagined COVID. So there are aspects that, that are absolutely unimaginable. Um, but there are a lot of aspects the majority of the aspects which which you can foresee and you can plan for and and i guess you know the first part of dealing with a crisis is all about um you know the planning and the preparation it, you know it wasn't raining when noah built the ark so what is a uh, maybe a definition from you as well cuz is a crisis a situation where you didn't imagine or you didn't plan or or you didn't practice <laughs> or cuz i'm i'm just wondering where where it become it moves from event to incident to, to crisis. crisis yeah so so the way I, I and and again great question so so the way i look at you know that escalation process is a crisis first of all is when an event has a significant materiality to the business and that can really impact the business. Um, and it's also that combined with the requirement to um, bring together different parties um, and coordinate those different parties so that you're external communications is the same as your internal communications which is the same as your hr strategy to deal with that event which is the same as the it strategy which is the same as the cyber strategy which is the same and and it's all the, the that coordination so that the person that's speaking to the press isn't saying yes we've got all this in hand or yes we're doing this when the it person is actually saying, well, no, we don't, because we're still investigating. So I think for me, where and 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 companies will have very clear, clearly defined escalation proceeds, um, and those are you know governed by the type of business that they do. Whether you know the business. So if you think about something like a bank, so there's the the CIA triad right it's the confidentiality integrity availability so if you think about a bank an issue to do with integrity and integrity of data is material if you think about uh, a telecommunications company like mine availability is material and depending on where what your company does will depend on what thresholds meet a crisis. But for me, um, it's to do with the impact combined with the coordination of multiple functions to have a singular strategy, a singular voice, singular source of the truth to be able to deal with this event that 
may or may not be, you know, foreseen. And so when, when I see the word crisis, I think of hair on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, and I'm going to guess really, that it doesn't have to be, though, right? No, 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 and that's really interesting. And that's so when I lecture on crises and crisis management, I always lecture on a principle called prudent overreaction. And I think one of the mistakes that some companies make is equating crises with a loss of control. And therefore being very reticent to call a crisis management uh, committee or team together um, because that to them would suggest that it's in extremis and you know that like you said that, that there is a loss of control whereas a mature crisis organization will call um, you know the crisis committee together as part of prudent overreaction, understanding, because they've been through this road year before and they've had the shovels in the face, that it's easier to stand something up and then wind it down once you no longer need it than actually stand something up while you're playing catch up. So not only building the aeroplane while you're flying the aeroplane, but also while the aeroplane is on fire. And it's easier um, and more mature organizations will espouse this principle of prudent overreaction, um, call a crisis committee as they anticipate an event. And like I said, it's easier to be on the front foot and de-escalate than the other way around. So thank you for that, Stuart. I mean, it's fascinating to... Uh to get in this i'm sure when you're when you're in the midst of it <laughs> it can get uh can go can get quite interesting as well i want to talk a bit about kind of the structure i'm looking at the the, the structure or a few points from the from the session where it talks about internal procedures um, methods of uh, exploitation um, looking at responsive recovery uh, with respect to security strategies, communications you touched on. And then last bit is resilience and uh, the, uh, you call it, or the, the calls it post-event wash-up, the, uh, right, the, the post-mortem. <laughs> so those elements, um, as you're thinking about a crisis management plan, do you think most organizations have those in place or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I... I do believe that most organizations will have, you know, those in place. And, and, and again, going back to COVID, most organizations have had to respond to a crisis because COVID affected us all. Um, so I do think that, you know, lessons have been learned. I mean, for, for me, COVID was, was sort of really interesting because as as we were kind of pre-COVID trialing as part of our resilience strategy, trialing working from home strategies, we were very risk averse. We would only roll 50 people on at a time and test the work from home and et cetera. But then, you know, from one day to the next here in the UK, almost we were, we were sort of shut down and it's like, you know, you all need to work from home. And, and suddenly that, had a greater imperative to sort of to move forward so do i think that um the companies have crisis management plans yes absolutely um i think the majority of them do um do i think that they're tested maybe less so um and that you know the scenarios are sort of thought through uh, and really exercised um it all depends on on your senior leadership and senior management. You know, I'm very lucky that all my senior leadership are incredibly bought in. But I know speaking from peers that some of them aren't as, um, you know, bought in as, as, as they may be. 
Um, so are there plans and procedures? I'd say predominantly yes. Um, are they exercised? Yes, um, to a certain degree. In terms of the, the, the resilience aspect, it's interesting, Sean, because as, as you were as you were speaking, you know, I was thinking about resilience in two ways. Resilience about the practitioners, because you can only run so many four minute miles with 50 kilos on your back. Um, and again, what quite a mature crisis management program and team would do is, you know, you have your alternates and you have people that are read in and you have people that are you know, you, you have a really good bench that can come in and come out. It's almost like an ice hockey match um, where people come in and come out um, and it's seamless. Um, but then there's also the resilience and, and about lesson le learning lessons. And I think potentially that bit is harder because when you have a crisis, something's gone dramatically wrong and, and it could either have been, you know, as a consequence of somebody's actions internally or, or, or as something externally. But predominantly, you need a very strong culture that has psychological safety within its core so that when you do lessons learn, it doesn't turn out into a finger pointing fest and let's look for somebody to hang because it was clearly their fault that they didn't secure the S3 buckets or whatever it might have been. Um, and of course, if you have that culture where, well, you could have a culture where it's, you know, few were over that, thank goodness, and everyone just goes home. Then you also have a culture where it's few, thank goodness, right, who are we going to shoot? And then there's the more mature culture where people are, um, you know, more receptive to learning. And there is that psychological safety where you say, okay, um, no fingers, no pointing. What happened and where can we learn? What went wrong? How can we improve? And let us just make sure that this never, ever happens again. And I think that that bit is 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 the more nuanced and the more mature organization that's able to say let's bring all these people to the into the room and then therefore there's there's no people that are defensive there's no people that are protectionist there's no people that are um that won't give you the whole version of events and say look you know it was my fault i missed i misconfigured like i said the s3 buckets or i in a physical world i i left the doors open and the river flooded in yep I feel we could have a whole conversation on the bench and the hockey analogy. <laughs> so maybe we can do that at some point. But I, I want to maple leaves. All right, I'm a I'm a King slash uh, Rangers fan. Uh, so, well, you at least right. you didn't terminate the interview right there and then. That's right. We're we're still going now. Somebody else might know. <laughs> no, but I am. Um, what you just described, though, it makes me think of something else that I've heard quite a bit of the last few weeks i've had a lot of conversations resilience keeps coming up and i want i want your perspective on there, there's business resilience operational resilience it resilience cyber resilience is in there and and i have a feeling that that cyber thinks that cyber resilience is all that matters well it does in their world um, but we tend to kind of forget the full business resilience and all the other pieces between that big picture and ourselves. Thoughts on that? Yeah. That's, you, that's you're talking COVID in one part and, and IT plays a role, security plays a role in that. And maybe yeah. that's an example where we did well, kind of maybe. <laughs> yes. But then generally, I think maybe we, we kind of forget that big picture. Yeah, no. And, and, and I think, you know, us as cyber practitioners sometimes can be a bit myopic. Um, I'm 
I think I'm very blessed insofar as within my remit in Virgin Media 2, I have to look at the entirety of the picture. And I'm in charge of, you know, global resilience. And when we, when we deal with crises and crisis management, it's not just cyber incidents that have escalated that, that, that are within my purview. It's, it's everything that, that reaches the crisis threshold um, and all that needs a coordination of, of the teams, as I explained before. So, so yes, no, I, I, I think um, the point you, you, you make, Sean, is, is, is quite opposite. And I think the point that resilience is broader than cyber um, is, is very well made. And I also think that at the end of the day, we are here to serve and protect the business. Um, and, and we lose sight of that at our peril. It's one of these things where you said earlier in the conversation, really interestingly, that you, you know, you're a risk nerd. And that really resonated with me because m my role, I view my role as a risk practitioner because I can never 100% secure a business any business because the only way i can secure a business is take your phone and your laptop smash them up put them in a faraday cage and bury them in a garden but then there's not much business going to be done so that there there is always an element of risk and it's our job as cyber practitioners to be um the exponents of risk to make sure that the risk is known and understood and then that the senior leadership of the of the company make an informed decision on the risk and then when we move into resilience to understand that we are but a but a cog in a in a, in a greater in a greater entity in a greater machine um i think the moment you start thinking in such an iso isolationist way um i think it's a hiding to to, to a dangerous place. Yeah, and then we I, uh, we could probably say, I don't know if the reverse is true is the right, right way to put it, but if the business doesn't look at how some other event might impact or rely upon cyber to either protect the cyber bits or to leverage the cyber bits for other pieces. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot to, lot to consider there, of course. No, the, uh, the, the, there is, and I think as, as again as as cyber as a cyber security as cyber security practitioners and as an industry, I don't think we do ourselves many favors because predominantly I think when we're challenged we revert to jargon and alphabet soup, um, and when we think about security we don't really we, we we sort of typically sometimes try and go for try try and let try and make good great be the good be the enemy of great did i get that right or great be the enemy of good do you know what i mean that yes, I do. 80, 80 I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not able to help you much there <laughs> no 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 <laughs> don't, I'm, don't, I'm confused as well which one is it <laughs> No, no, no! Don't let, uh, don't let great be the enemy of good. In other words, don't go for the gold-plated standard and spend three months finding that extra ten percent when good is good enough. Yep, that's what I meant to say in a rather inarticulate way. <laughs> well, you, you you said it well, and I think everybody's going to understand. Um, Stuart. Uh, you have a few fellow CISOs and a VCSO joining on on stage there. Different uh, looks like manufacturing, um, maybe a technology company, and then you have a cybersecurity agency of, agency of Catalonia. Mm -hmm. So a, a, quite a wide variety of perspectives there. What do you? What do you expect to happen on stage? 
you all come together and is it use case time storytelling time what's going on um i i'm actually really looking forward not just to the to the to the event and not just to infosec but but to the panel because it's so diverse um and and diverse in in its in its background like you've just said you know there's the government of catalonia and 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 other industries telco and 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 the rest and and i think that that diversity of industry and diversity of experience and diversity of pressure um as it comes to the crisis can only help um expose um amazing learnings because if if we go back to when we were talking about the CIA triad you know the government of catalonia has different um imperatives to me as a telecommunications company or as the fast moving goods company and therefore a crisis for you know a crisis for me might not be a crisis for them and vice versa and it would it's going to be fascinating um to see the different perspectives and the different learnings from each of those um because the different focuses that each of those entities has i think will give a greater richness to the audience i'm hoping so anyway i'm excited uh, i'm excited and uh yeah that's why it caught my attention uh just to see the the group and and uh I'm thrilled you and I had a chance to chat and I'm, I'm hopefully hoping we can have a chance to connect there in person as well. No, definitely. Very good. Very good. Well, Stuart, uh, I hope, hope you and the, the panel have a great time, uh, sharing stories, uh, sharing, uh, shovel marks. Yes. With each other. <laughs> Punches in the face. Punches in the like face. That, that amazing that. philosopher, Mr. Tyson said. I'm looking forward to seeing his fight as well. Does he have a fight coming up? I think he has a fight with um, with a YouTuber. Con Conor McGregor? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> I think one of the Paul brothers. Okay. So he's coming yeah. out of retirement to fight. There you go. There you go. Well, hopefully he remembers some of the lessons he's learned over the years. <laughs> Not too many uh, punches in the face. All right. Well, um, we all have our own cyber punches to, uh, to deal with. And, and this session crisis management responding to the unimaginable can certainly help. Uh, Stuart, I'm excited to meet you there in person and to hear this session along with your fellow panelists. It's Thursday, the 6th at 2.05 local time there in London. And, uh, so thanks again for this great chat. You're, you're welcome back anytime. I think there's a couple of topics in here we can, we can spend more time on for sure. I'd love to come back whenever you'll have me, Sean. Yeah, it's absolutely. been an absolute pleasure. I appreciate that. And for everybody listening, thanks for joining me for a new on location episode as we uh, do our chats on the road to London. And uh, hopefully Mark will join me for the next one. And we'll see everybody there for Info Security Europe 2024. Thanks, everybody.